Welcome back for uh, chapter two of the, discussing Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life. I'm here with Samuel Chesakedi, yep. and we are, uh, we're going to continue our discussion. I think last week we went for 45 minutes. We might try to keep it a bit shorter yeah, this time. Yeah, we did. I didn't even realise <laughs> uh, that uh, it went a bit that long. It's uh, easy, to, easy to get carried away. Yeah. But I've actually probably got a thought that uh, because it's a it's a natural conversation happening about something that is so deep that uh, you know it's uh, what I've enjoyed the most about this program and thanks for the invitation is the naturalness you know, if, if it's a word to say it the naturalness of it that if it's natural uh, no you know prepared professional you know yeah. sort of a script. Yeah. Uh, so we can just sit and have a conversation about you know yeah. what we've we've, yeah. we've uh, you know learned from from Jordan Peterson's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, this this week the chapter is uh, chapter two, rule two. Uh, treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Yeah. Now uh, he he begins by making this observation that uh, people tend to look after their animals better than themselves when, yeah. when it comes to like prescription medication. Yeah. Like they've done research and found that uh, an extraordinary number of people will get will get their medical prescription, but they they won't be diligent to, to follow the directions. And, yeah. and so they're treating themselves poorly and yet they won't do that with their pets. Yeah. So what does that say about human nature? Uh, it's it's rather interesting when I was reading that particular section, I chuckled mm -hmm. inside because I have done that. Mm -hmm. I have been I've been given medication uh, and uh, I just didn't really stick to uh, to it and I realized so I'm actually uh, what he's saying there is is mm -hmm. true because I, I I have been myself uh, you know I found myself with that particular type of attitude and I think it it says. There are two ways, two ways to, to look at it, and, and he gives us his, his point of view. The first way to look at it is that, well, maybe because people love their pet and they, you know, the pet can't take care of themselves, so yeah, they're responsible for taking care of the pet, and otherwise, you know, the life of the pet would be miserable. So, you know, you therefore feel like, you know, you have to do all the right things by your pet because the pet can't do it for itself. Mm. Mm. When it comes to you, you're a human being, you can do it, you cannot mm. do it. You know, it's up to you and how you choose to do it. Mm. Uh, but the question is, why would you do the right thing by your pet, not by you? Mm. Yeah. Uh, I found this a difficult chapter. It's a long chapter and yeah. he, he seems to go into this long sort of convoluted yeah. uh, narrative um, before he gets to the point. but. When he gets to the point, you can see sort of the progression of what he's trying to say. And, and yeah. as far as I can understand it, um, he, he seems to be saying that there's something in human beings that um, devalue themselves. There's something mm -hmm. innate to human beings mm -hmm. where we, we have this, we either err in terms of, you know, hyper um, esteeming ourselves, um, uh, too highly, yep. sort of having this, this um, inflated opinion of ourselves, mm. hyperinflated opinion of ourselves, yep. Yep. or or we we collapse into sort of this self loathing where we where we feel like we don't uh, have any right to be here at all. And yep. it it seems to well, I, I read recently that among young people there's a, a real spike in suicides. Yep. Or attempted suicide. Oh, it's a crisis level here in Australia. And, and some people have tried to attribute that to social media and how, um, you know, it, social media is very narcissistic and, and self focused, and yeah. people feel worse about themselves when they spend a lot of time on Facebook, for right. example. Right. But we're also living in an age of, of despair. You know, we've got climate change alarmism saying there's no hope for the future, the earth is doomed and all of these things to which I don't subscribe, yeah, I yeah. don't know about you, but but it, it, it creates this atmosphere of despair for young people, they can't see a future. Right. Right. 
Right. And so that's a factor as well. But yeah, yeah. I find it quite interesting. There are two ways to uh, to answer the question, the why are we like this? So Jordan Peterson starts with, you know, stating the fact that we all can recognize. Mm -hmm. And there's a body of research to it that, you know, people don't take their medication, people treat themselves poorly, uh, so they don't look after themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's simply a simple fact, and everybody knows that. And then he has to answer the question, why is the state of affair this way? Mm -hmm. Now, there are typically two answers to this question as we move in society now. Number one is to find out external factors mm -hmm. that are responsible for the condition. Like, for example, if we say uh, there is a, you know, a very high rate of suicide among teenagers, okay, why is that, that the case? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, social media, if you notice, we've already blamed something external. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, okay, well, you know, the report in the news, okay, there's climate change, there's, all these external things are creating a condition of despair that makes people not look. So in other words, the problem is out there. Mm. And so the second way of answering it is the problem is in here. Yeah. And the person who answers the question, the problem is out there, it seems a very easy way. It's you know, readily available. It probably be a lot more easily acceptable. To externalize the problem. Yeah, and the problem of answering the problem is within here, it comes across as you're victimizing the victim, and no one wants to do that. Mm. And as I was reading Jordan, I was trying to go, um, he taken the long route because his answer is that the problem is in here. Mm. And so he looks at the problem of why human beings treat themselves poorly by saying that the problem is deep within the human mm -hmm. and it's, it's good and gracious about it because it's very balanced so it's the reason why you had to go and find the ancient answers within an ancient story mm. in the book of genesis yeah the creation yeah go to the creation story to start from the very beginning to be able to give if he didn't do it that way if he just simply said look the problem is in here People say, how dare you say that? You know, how do you victimize yeah. people already victim? Yes. And so he goes on the way back to the book of Genesis to say, okay, well, look at it this way. That, you know, the old, the old story says that man was made and created, put in the garden. And so he was all wrapped up in, in a sense of wealth. And, and now, 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 the problem, I guess, with referencing the Bible is that he knows that he's going to encounter a lot of people who... We don't attribute any value or truth to the Bible. Yeah. So he actually makes sort of some preliminary comments about that. He, yeah. and, he, and he says, uh, he says, scientific truths were made explicit a mere 500 years ago yeah. with the work of Francis Bacon yeah. um, and others. And he, and he says, um, because we are so scientific now and so determinedly materialistic, it is very difficult for us to even understand that other ways of seeing can and do exist. Yeah. And so he, he would assert that, as we touched on last week, that though Genesis, um, he, he, he doesn't comment on whether it's literally true or not, but he says it contains truth that, right. that are, is imperative. So yeah. the old stories, yeah. yeah. So, it, I think it's, it's rather interesting. When I, if, I, when I was reading that section myself, you know, a couple of things rang into my mind, which is, I am very, I, I will confess, I'm very weary. Oh, is it weary? Weary. Um, weary. Weary, that's it. Yeah. This has taught me this so many times. Look at I am weary. Just forgive my, my French. You can uh, be weary and weary. But oh, yeah. <laughs> weary means I'm weary about yeah. the way the term science is used. Yeah. Because there is a lot of equivocation. See how what he says. We are materialistic. In other words, the use of the word science in this sense becomes a scientism. The idea that, you know, the testable, the discoverable, the, the world is only that which we see now. Hmm. And so, you know, it's called physicalism, materialism, physicalism, and it's the word science is used to try to discover. Hmm. And therefore, you, 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 what you do is you do away with the metaphysics. Mm. Okay, the idea that there's more to what we know in life than just simply the 
scientific truth. Yeah. And it's it's if I could jump in on that point, yeah. but it's it's been constantly disappointing to me that that people limit their empirical exploration of truth to yeah. the materialistic. Yeah. Because I've always asserted that you can apply the same sort of empirical search yeah. to spiritual truth. For example, if, if you if you take seriously the Bible's assertion that God is there, he's personal and he can be known, we can yeah. seek him and find him, yeah. then there are ways to empirically approach that. You can, right. for example, begin to pray and, and you know, some people... They begin to pray and they don't get an immediate answer, so therefore they quickly draw a conclusion and toss it yeah. to the side. But no, the Bible actually says to connect with God, you have to approach Him on His terms, yeah, and yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and that involves humility and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and earnestness, and you know sometimes desperation and and all of those things. And yeah. you know my experience and yeah. and I believe yours and many others has yeah, been yeah, that yeah. we've we've had a, a quite an empirical search. And, and come to a belief which is not unfounded, which is not unscientific. We may not understand all of the, you know, how God exists or how God uh, reveals himself. And we may not even understand completely the, the entire nature of God, but, you know, we have enough to act on yeah, you know, yeah. and be intellectually honest. Yeah, yeah. And so I think, as you're saying there, I think, you know, if, if what is empirical, is that which could be tested, mm. testable. Uh, very often it's the ism that comes in. Empiricism uh, is the delineation, the delimitation of the fact that the world is, what we can test is only what our five senses can have access to. Mm -hmm. That is gone from just simply being able to empirically test something, whether it is both metaphysical or, or, or you know, physical, and mm. so on and so forth, to uh, seeing, saying, only that which our five senses can have access to, that's the only thing we're going to go with. Therefore, every order of spiritual, metaphysical truth is just simply chucked out. In that sense, as you were saying, like, it's quite interesting, the person who prays, if they believe that in the metaphysical truth that God is, and there is more to the world than just simply that which our five senses can have access to, and then they can see like Jesus did, used to do. You can teach a metaphysical truth by using physical examples. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus wanted to teach the fact that people heal things mm -hmm. and those things they keep in their heart, they act on it and it produces fruits. In other words, people hear the word and advice, you know, those things. So, and he uses an example in the physical mm -hmm. that goes this way, that the man went to sow seeds. Mm -hmm. So he's using a farmer's example yeah. to teach a metaphysical truth. Yeah. And so I wanted to use that to talk about prayer. Let's say it doesn't make sense if I came and knock on the door and, and you didn't answer. Mm -hmm. uh, if I did not know that that was the, your door I was knocking on and that somebody lives in this house, mm -hmm. then if I knock and knock and not get an, an answer, when I walk away, I'm not walking away because people don't answer their door. It's because I assume that there is no one in. Mm -hmm. The person who pray, who assumed there was no God, is more likely to quit after they haven't gotten an answer. Yeah. The person who pray, knowing that it is, even if it was just in a realm of possibility, like, yeah. let's not even talk about, you know, sort of probability and likelihood. Even if it was just possible that God exists. Yeah. The person, if it was a possibility that somebody's in that house, mm -hmm. if I knock on the door the first time, the second time, if you are a reasonable person, you go, oh, you try to go and knock on the window. Or see if there is a doorbell there. Mm -hmm. You see, you're trying to change the methods of access to, because you know there is possibility somebody's in the house. Yes. So, as you're saying, you know, empirically being able to go, yeah, there's God. You can have access to these metaphysical truths mm -hmm. by actually being persistent, seeking God on God's terms. You go, exactly. maybe the person, this, this house, for you to have access, you need to ring the doorbell, but you've been knocking. Or you knocked on the wall instead of on the window. So you'll be, you know, taking all these in mm. because you, you are convinced that there's a possibility somebody's in there. Now, if I knew that there's a probability somebody's in there, my effort will probably down. And even if you knew that if you believe someone is in there, but they didn't want to come to the door, yeah. 
you can persuade them to come to the door just by being persistent. (laughs) And and actually Jesus told the parable about that. Yeah, exactly. About the necessity for persistence. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So it it brings us back to saying that you can, it's it's ludicrous to try to find the, the deeper, the answer to the deepest question of the human heart just by limiting oneself to the physical age. Yeah. This is where John Peterson goes to the story in the book of Genesis. But I'm going to say something quite on that uh, while we read it. Because as a Christian minister, um, I find that there is a contention I've had with most of my brethren, uh, 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 a number of my brethren, and it is the Church of God in general. Yeah. Uh, what we had done with the book of Genesis, once the discussion about science and and so on and so forth started to pop up. It's 500 years ago. It's not not that long. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we, you know, we started to try to you know uh, try to um, you know try to reconcile. Some some people have even done concordism. You know, mm-hmm. try to read what we we discover in science and try to say how does that fit with the mm-hmm. with the book of Genesis. And then we, we just get caught up into this mechanism. But what, what is what most people have done is to Turn the book of Genesis into a child. Their intent was was good. Childlike stories. It's like mm-hmm. if I want to teach my two years old about human beings, I can dis- dif- I can draw a cartoon of a human being. Yeah. Because I'm trying to lower this so they can understand it. Yeah. But if I leave them there, then they're going to think just human beings are like cartoons. And it puts the Genesis story in the the same realm as fairy tales. Exactly. Yeah. It's done a huge yeah. disservice to the metaphysical truth that the, the, the story of Genesis does. But look at how Jordan Peterson, well, I don't think Jordan Peterson is a believer in the sense that I, I can say that he has confessed Christ mm-hmm. the way, you know, we Christians say. Mm-hmm. But look at his interaction with the book of Genesis, highly intellectually. Mm-hmm. Well, he tells you, he doesn't have to believe literally in a, in, a, in a literalistic sense, mm-hmm. what, what is in there, but the deep question that he answers for why are we despising ourselves yes. can only be found by understanding that we had a spark of the divine, we were made on the image of God, as mm-hmm. to say, yeah. you know, and then something went wrong. And so for yeah. we know deep within us. I mean, already outwardly people know how malevolent we can be as human yeah. beings, but we have the consciousness of how malevolent we are inside. So, uh, can, I, can I read a quote from yeah. him on that point? Yes. Because, because one of the interesting things he draws out, which is surprising, is that um, the concept of original sin, yeah. um, he, and it, which is not popular amongst academics, um, and he says, you know, contrasting human beings to animals, mm-hmm. he, he says, only man could conceive of the rack, the iron made, and then the thumb screw. Yeah. Only man could, in, only man will inflict suffering for the sake of suffering. Of suffering, yeah. That is the best de- definition of evil I've been able to formulate. Yeah. Animals can't manage that, but humans, with their excruciating, semi divine capacities, mm-hmm. most certainly can. Mm. And with this realization, we have well nigh full legitimization of the idea, very popular in modern intellectual circles, of original sin. Yeah. Now, it's, I think what you see there is that, think about the the cat is a predator, John Mm. explains, like the lion is a predator. Mm. And in a predatory nature, they don't inflict suffering for the sake of the suffering. They just simply want to get a prey and eat. Mm. And it's human beings who actually have got this capacity to, to inflict gratuitous pain. Yeah. And, and, and so with that, he's just explaining that human beings have got the propensity to do this. Mm. And they do actually do it. Yeah. We human beings do it. Do, do, and how can you otherwise explain that? Mm. And so the, the general belief, the idea that we're somehow so good, mm. flies in the face of the evil that yeah. man is capable of yes. you inflicting. Got to, you've got to ignore 
a lot of the events of the 20th century to, to be able to believe that. Yeah. And not ancient history, recent yeah. history. And be so naive, and that's what yeah. he's saying, that yeah. you've got to be so naive yeah. about, you know, human history, the recent human history, to believe in such, you know, preposterous idea. Yeah. But, so what it says is, the reason why subconsciously you men treat himself poorly is because men, I mean, this includes, I mean, we mean humanity here, so mm. humanity mm. is because we know. We know there's malevolence inside. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that's the crunch. And he, he couldn't find that answer. I, I'm actually ready to say mm. there's no other place in ancient literature or in any search for truth anywhere else you could find that kind of deep answer to the problem, the condition of man, but in the book of Genesis. And they shying away from responsibility. Look at what happens in the garden. So God made, makes man and is given him divine nature. Mm. Goodness, if you will. That's why we desire goodness all the time, even though we know we're malevolent. Mm. And so it's given an instruction. Responsibility is minimum, minimal. Mm. The good is that which God says to the man. Man doesn't have to work it hard. He doesn't have to try hard. He just simply going to pick up what God says is good. And that's what he does. Mm. And men desired to go and eat the fruit mm. that afforded him the capacity to determine for himself what is right from what is wrong. Okay. Now, in the process of eating this, so the the ancient snake mm -hmm. shows up and deceives the woman to eat the fruit, and the woman gives the fruit to the man, and so suddenly. Something happens to them. Mm. The guilt, the shame, which explains their reaction. They go and hide. They make a bit of a piece of clothing of some yeah. sort. Yeah. They never knew they were naked. They, and Jordan Pierce explained explain that's the vulnerability of man. Men discover mm. man is vulnerable now. Yeah. So man goes hiding, yeah. which has become what is. And that's, that's kind of the reaction of people when you present them with truth about God. They're, there's there's a kind of a, a self-defense mechanism that kicks in when when people come that come under conviction. You yeah. you 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 begin to explain the way of the way of God, the way of yeah. Christ, and yeah. and hungry people who have been looking for the answer will respond favorably. Yeah. But other people who have sort of built up their own Self righteousness yeah. will respond with almost, with the hostility, or, mm. or they'll run away, and it's like it's like you're you're confronting you, you're illuminating yeah. their nakedness, yeah. Yeah. and they want to run and hide. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember reading a book about a he was an atheist, he was a Jewish atheist academic, guy named Art Katz, yeah. who who um, at the height of his sort of intellectual. Uh, influence, mm -hmm. he became a Christian and uh, it caused all kinds of uh, friction with his intellectual colleagues and and one woman said to him damn it, uh, uh, even when you're silent you're a, you're a living ac accusation <laughs> and, and, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and that's yeah. kind of true of us all you know, if we represent Christ the way, the truth and the life yeah uh, though we don't need, intend to be an accusation to yeah. people, people take it that way because <laughs> innately people know their own their own uh, moral uh, deficit, yeah. And, yeah. and and yeah. and and so when they're confronted with this truth, they'll react defensively. Yeah. it's it's rather interesting when you look at church history. Mm. Um, Within the Roman society, the reason why, one of the reasons why Christians were persecuted mm. is because the, the, the uh, Roman society, you know, you know, I think, um, uh, who's, who's uh, I'm trying to remember the historian, uh, but I remember his name, just Josephus. Jesus. No, no, not Josephus, I think it's Tacitus, mm. uh, writes that the, their lives put the lives of all the other Romans to shame. Mm. They did not participate in Roman baths, mm -hmm. where there was indulgence of eating excessively. 
they didn't participate in sexual orgies that the Romans participated in. And so their kind of life was making the Romans uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it, it's quite interesting that when Adam had this moment of guilt and shame, which, you know, it's, it's, kept, it's become the, the, the plague that basically plagues the world, where we know things as human beings that we've done in the dark. We know the darkest thoughts of our own heart. Yeah. We know these things, and, and, and we would never want those darkest of our thoughts to be put to the public, right? It is, and that explains really well why men knowing how dark man is inside, men would not be, you know, you're capable of taking good care of himself because man knows man is wretched. Mm. Man is a wretched. Mm. And so when God shows up, because he's coming for the conversation, a regular daily conversation, he's mm. there with Adam. Mm. And so Adam is gone hiding in shame, his body. Mm. And, and God asked, John Business thinks it's a bizarre question to ask from God, as they couldn't see through the bush. Mm. Of course God could see where Adam was. The question was not to eliminate God. Where are you? He asked Adam. Mm. The question was to eliminate Adam. What has happened to you? Mm. So that Adam would take responsibility for what has happened to him. Yeah. And if he did, that entire excru excruciating, painful situation would have stopped. The thing is, Could have been redeemed. Yeah. the interesting thing is that Adam's first reaction to uh, being a, aware was of his nakedness wasn't just wanting to run and hide in shame. It was actually also fear. Yeah, because uh, if he had, because because I think God, in asking Adam, "Where are you?" He he was not just wanting him to. to uh, he was not just wanting Adam to accept responsibility, but he was also he was that. But he was also wanting Adam to confess mm. and be honest. Yeah, and and this is the thing that we have this promise in the Bible: that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. Yeah. To forgive us our sins yeah, and to yeah. cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All yeah. And if our first reaction upon being aware of our own moral nakedness mm. is to run and hide mm. and to be afraid of God, yeah. we, the good news is that you can actually run to God yeah. and you can confess your sins yeah. and, and he is faithful and just yeah. to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Yeah. 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 And yeah. And that's the gospel. Yeah, that's yeah. the good news. And, yeah. and 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 so Jordan Peterson doesn't leave us with this despair about the human condition. He no. also he also emphasizes the fact that we are made in the image of God. We have this spark of divinity yeah. within us, and and that um, the way to bring order to the chaos of this situation is to begin to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And of course. In order to love our neighbours, we also have to see value in ourselves. Yeah. And we can see value in ourselves, I think, primarily because God has placed a value upon us. Firstly, we're created in his image. Yeah. So originally we have a value. Even, even before we come to Christ, we yeah. have this value because... Yeah. And I think that's why the devil hates us so much, because we're created <laughs> in the image of God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course... Um, God has reiterated this value in sending his own son yeah. to die, to pay the penalty of sin for us so that, you know, we are, we are valued twice. We are valued because we are created in the image of God and yeah. we are valued because even though we've strayed, we've been redeemed at great cost. Yeah. And, and so all the more reason to run to God for mercy. Yeah, it's, it's uh, th there are, you know, a few steps that I... Um, I look at uh, within that really beautiful Christian story. The first thing that we look at within the Christian story uh, is that, uh, you know, from that standpoint where we were, where you recognize the wretchedness of men, and then you think it's sort of a, a, it's a bit of a dark picture. I was talking to a friend uh, once who said to me, the reason why I don't like the Christian story is because it's so dark. I'm like, what do you mean it's dark? So you start with this, the, 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 the proposition 
that men are broken, they're wretched, they, I'm like, yeah, but does that not look actually true to you? Like, are you looking at the world as we look at it? But I said to him, you've, you've only known a small part mm. of actually the description of the condition of men without following the through to the entire story. The entire story is that what brings us back to that which you desire, you want men to be good, but you know you can't achieve that, is by recognizing that even in the midst of this entire darkness of the condition of our heart, how much of the dark thoughts and dark evil intents we have, we are still capable of goodness. Mm. What could possibly make such a dark and darkened man capable of, of even one act of goodness? Mm. It is because of the divine spark, mm. the divine image within us. And that is what actually holds our conscience. When we, we actually, we feel guilty because we are guilty. Now we are guilty and we feel guilty because we know what goodness looks like. Exactly. Yeah. And it, what it does, it tells us we are capable of some small goodness. But we cannot turn ourselves good totally. Yeah. So from the prophets through to the coming of Jesus in the New Testament, the Christian story can be summarized this way. Man is broken. Man is wretched. Man desires to do good from the inward. But man is incapable of being good. And therefore... Men could not save himself from the condition within which man is, the sinful condition. And therefore, only God could save man. Okay? So, men want to, but man can't. Mm -hmm. God can, but only if God could become man, mm -hmm. then would he be able to do for man that which man couldn't do for himself. This is why Christ came down and became a man so he could live a perfect, you know, a morally perfect life, and then he could trade his place for our own so that now we can be capable of goodness in his strength. That's the beauty of the Christian story. Now, I'm saying that John Pearson went far, but not far enough, because you can encourage people to find the spark of divine and do, and try to save yourself by your own strength. It, it can encourage, we're in such a dark place now that people will be like, oh yeah, this is good. They can see some small progress, but the despair will step back in very quickly. Because all it takes is 10, 20, 30 failures of trying to do good for you to go, oh, it doesn't work. Hmm. So the greatest appeal is to say, you don't have to try in your own strength. Let Christ carry you. And he knows that because he actually says it himself. He says that Christ came and lived the perfect life as an archetype. Yes. But it does, it's not just an archetype. You want to live with it. You want to hold your hand mm -hmm. so that you can then find yourself doing good in him. When you stumble, you have his forgiveness instead of beating yes. yourself down. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, we'll leave it there, actually. Um, the, these... Um, these discussions over these chapters are, are kind of just to whet people's appetites so that they might actually go and get the book and, and read it for themselves. And, uh, yeah, certainly a lot of depth there. Uh, yeah, it was, it was difficult wading through that chapter for me. It was, it was, it was heavy going. Yeah, I should I should have got the audio version and like you and <laughs> like yeah, yeah. No, I, I it. probably my, myself is I think. When I, um, I think for me to read the book, I need to sit down. I've got to cut a chunk of my time within my schedule to actually yeah. start reading. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, if I have an audio book, so I love audio books, and it's when it's read by the author themselves, mm -hmm. uh, I, I could go to bed and, and before I sleep, you know, from time to time, you get those moments where I'm, I've got a routine. Mm -hmm. I don't know how when I go to bed, but mm -hmm. if, if you're still awake, mm -hmm. And instead of letting your mind wander here and there and everywhere, mm. how about you learn something from a book or if I get up at yeah. 3 a.m. and yeah. I can't go to sleep and I've got half an hour. Why not yeah. listen to half an hour of a chapter? Yeah. So that's, that's how yeah. I... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, so, yeah, thanks for watching. Um,
keep coming back to the channel because we're going to keep keep going. Shall we keep going? Yeah, I think it's yeah. a fantastic uh, book. I've enjoyed enjoyed it because it's you know analysis are quite yeah. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. So uh, please remember to subscribe and hit the notification icon so you can be alerted to when the next episode comes out. So thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. I'm still coming back and I'm enjoying this program. So it's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.